Okay, so actually, let me do Let's get this the right side. That makes a little better sense. Okay. Um, we're almost done with the semester. We have David Hume and Immanuel Kant. And maybe I should remind you before I forget that our next <laughs> reading is the last one. It is pages 717 to 742. Kant, I will warn you, is like you probably already think this already, but it, he's very hard to understand. Um, if you've had a taste of Kant, you may have read a little bit of Kant in like your intro to philosophy class, maybe Groundwork of Morals. Groundwork of Morals is like the easy Kant, which if you've read that, you, that was already very hard. So this is pretty hard stuff we're about to do. Um, I have posted on Moodle a little assignment for you to do with Kant. So I've posted a series of questions, 23 questions, that will guide you through the reading. I'm not going to ask you to answer 23 questions about Kant. I'm not that evil. What I will do, though, is I want you to answer five. So out of the 23 questions, pick five, and you can, and they're divided by different like chapters and sections and parts. You can't do more than two of questions per part. So I'm trying to get you to distribute the load across there. Um, and why do I give you all these questions for this? Partly so that you can also, it'll help you with the reading. So I'm not going to ask you to answer every single one and turn that in for a grade, but you might want to try, at least take notice of these questions. That'll help guide you through the reading and give you something specific to lock onto for what you're doing. Um, and that can be either typed up or handwritten, and we'll just take that at the beginning of our next class. Um, sound good? Any questions about next week's reading and homework? Then, um, what I want to do is have us look at this parts of this reading an inquiry concerning human understanding. As the group just told you in the biography of Hume, Hume uh, originally wrote this huge book called A Treatise of Human Nature in his 20s. And the way Hume describes it is that it was when it, it came off the press, stillborn. Meaning that he, he wrote this exciting thing, a very revolutionary idea that was filled with like skeptical ideas, very like, it was a very different kind of philosophy. He was expecting everyone who read this to turn around and like respond to it and talk about it. And nobody did. It was like it never happened. And it was very disappointing for him. So a few years later, he writes these other books. One of them is An Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding. And in this one is the part mainly about his theory of knowledge. He wrote another one called An Essay Concerning... Uh, human morals that is about his moral theory. Um, the main themes I want us to take away from this is his version of empiricism and his version of skepticism. Based on the sort of line of history we've been tracing, I tried to tell you last time that Berkeley was essentially taking Locke to his logical conclusion. Well, Hume is going to take Berkeley to his logical conclusion. Um, there are some aspects of this that are actually really interesting that we didn't read and we're not going to talk about. But one of the things, for instance, is Hume is going to that Hume argues that there is no self. So Berkeley thought there are no material objects, but there's still like a self that is having these perceptions. Hume says when Descartes does the whole "I think, therefore I am." Hume says, I don't know what this I is supposed to be. I think, therefore, what? There are thoughts, is what he would say. When I look inward and I try to find the self that makes me an individual, he says, I don't find anything. All I find are different feelings, thoughts, beliefs, emotions. But that's not, where's the self in all that? All I find are just these fleeting ideas and feelings. So he concludes, there must not be a self. That was one of the kind of controversial things that he thought more people would be interested in talking about, and no one did. Um, 
I want us to talk about his theory of knowledge. Uh, if you have your book, open it up and let's look at some of these, these things that he's bringing our attention to on 539. Um, one of the things, the very first thing he kind of does in the opening of, of this reading I had you do is look at the difference between ideas and impressions. And this will correspond loosely to something to the things that Locke has said about the difference between um, two kinds of ideas as well. Um, so look on 539. I want to read a little bit of the, the paragraph that's on the bottom part on the left side. He says, Here, therefore, we may divide all the perceptions of the mind into two classes or species which are distinguished by their different degrees of force and vivacity. The less forcible and lively are commonly denominated thoughts or ideas. The other species want a name in our language and in, and in most others, I suppose, because it was not requisite for any but philosophical purposes to rank them under a general term or appellation. Let us therefore use a little freedom and call them impressions, employing that word in a sense somewhat different from the usual. By the term impression, then, I mean all our more lively perceptions when we hear, or see, or feel, or love, or hate, or desire, or will. The impressions are distinguished from the ideas, which are the less lively perceptions of which we are conscious when we reflect on any of those sensations or movements above mentioned. So here we have ideas and impressions. All he says about ideas, they are less forceful and lively, and of impressions, those are more forceful and lively. Um, what he wants here's another way to think about this and the idea here is that ideas are copies of impressions impressions are the, the experiences that you are having sort of immediately what you're having right now it's that present moment experience and he talks about the, them coming from the outward experience and inward experience None of this should sound too revolutionary, because this sounds a lot like Locke. Uh, and I think that's exactly right. He's just following in Locke's footsteps. Um, so every, and then he says, I have this quote here, it's on the other side on 539, that all the materials of thinking are derived from either our outward or our inward sentiment. Um, so every idea you have either comes from, the way Locke would put it, from sensation or reflection. Um, this just means that Hume is another empiricist, just like Locke. So ideas are what he call are copies of what he calls impressions. Um, so everything that is in your mind is either an immediate impression you're having right now, or it's like a copy of, of those impressions, either a memory or the way in which you can, through imagination, dream up new and interesting thoughts that are combinations of your previous impressions. Locke says that there are essentially two proofs of empiricism that we find in this section. One of them is that all of our ideas can be traced to simple parts that are derived from experience. So you can't find a single idea, a single thing in your mind that is not traceable to experience. We tried this a little bit with Locke. Maybe I could try this again, but can you think of anything, any idea, any thought that is not traceable to an experience? Something that is, something you can think about that you've never experienced. If I wanted to think about, and we may have done this with Locke, but it's not a bad re review. If I want to think about a golden mountain, how is that possible since I've never experienced a golden mountain? What do you think he would want to say? Yeah. Because you've experienced mountains and you've experienced gold separately, so your mind can't combine the two. So I'm able, the idea is still from experience because the basic component parts are still from experience. 
The other argument he gives, once again, is similar to what Locke says, which is that without the source of experience, there's no corresponding idea. If you're born blind, you have no idea of color. If you're born deaf, you have no idea of sound. This seems to be a very strong indicator. Where do the ideas come from? They've got to come from the experience. If you got them some other way, then you can be able to have those ideas apart from the experiences. <coughs> Here's something a little different, though, that he brings up on 540. He brings up this case of the missing shade of blue. Let's take a look at this. This sounds like a Hardy Boys novel, the missing shade of blue. Um, So look on the bottom left, I'm going to read a good portion of this um, on 540, the bottom left paragraph, and let's take our way through most of this, and then I'm going to ask you what's going on in this passage. You'll notice um, this is some kind of problem for empiricism, but let's see what you think about this. There is, however, one contradictory phenomenon which may prove that it is not absolutely impossible for ideas to arise independent of their correspondent impressions. I believe it will readily be allowed that the several distinct ideas of color which enter by the eye, or those of sound which are conveyed by the ear, are really different from each other, though at the same time resembling. Now if this is true of different colors, it must be no less so of the different shades of the same color. And each shade produces a distinct idea independent of the rest. For if this should be denied, it is possible by the continual gradation of shades to run a color insensibly into what is most remote from it. And if you will not allow any of the means to be different, you cannot without absurdity deny the extremes to be the same. Suppose, therefore, a person to have enjoyed his sight for 30 years and to have become perfectly acquainted with colors of all kind except one particular shade of blue. For instance, which it never has been his fortune to meet with. Let all the different shades of that color, except that single one, be placed before him. Descending gradually from the deepest to the lightest, it is plain that he will perceive a blank where that shade is wanting and will be sensible that there is a greater distance in that place between the contiguous colors than in any other. Now I ask, whether it is possible for him, from his own imagination, to supply this deficiency and raise up to himself the idea of that particular shade, though it had never been conveyed to him by his senses? Here's his answer. I believe there are few, but will be of the opinion that he can. So. Maybe first, the basic thing he's getting at is he thinks that it's possible for somebody who has never experienced some particular shade of blue to figure it out just by comparing the ideas he already has. But if you can do that, then you can come up with some new idea apart from experience. Two questions for you to think about, for us to discuss right now. One, do you think that do you think somebody could do this? Do you think somebody could figure out the missing shade of blue without ever experiencing it? And secondly, do you think that's inconsistent with empiricism? Sarah? Wouldn't we all come up with a different color, like shade of blue? Like, it could be between those two there, but wouldn't our, everyone's perception be different of what color would go there? Why would... How... How could we all be different if it was the shade that lies right between those two? Are there several colors between them? We might think there might be maybe a, a range of colors, and maybe that. Suppose you're right. That would still be. That's still kind of consistent with Hume would say. Um, do you think? So you do you think that? people wouldn't have a problem coming up with a brand new color. Even if we didn't all come up with the exact same one, we could still do it. <laughs> yeah, Rob? As the shade goes, someone can think of like maybe a little bit darker of a shade, and then I might think it's a little lighter of a shade, because you can't really see the, they're yeah. exactly going at the same rate. 
Yeah, if you need to look on the computer screen, it's more nicely done. It's just the projector's fault here. But you could, the point is the, the same. The visual isn't exactly right. Mm -hmm. Suppose you had it done perfectly right, would you be able to conjure up that new image? Yeah. Um, I think that the question that you asked is that inconsistent with empiricism. Right. I think that it would be inconsistent with empiricism because you wouldn't need experience to imagine that shade in between that one blue and the other. It's more of a um, like strategic kind of um, I forget I'm trying to think of the word but I can't think of the word. <laughs> it's a strategic, it's more of a strategic thing than an experience thing because how many times do you experience that color in between those two colors exactly? You might not have ever experienced it. So I think that it's kind of inconsistent with the whole idea of empir empiricism. You kind of just are going in a sequence. Granny, hold your hand for a moment. Um, well, in order to defend empiricism, can't you argue that you're com like to get the missing shade, you're combining your experience of several of the shades already on the screen? Yeah, so you might think that you're just kind of blending what you already got, right? And that maybe that's how we come up with the new color. Um, <coughs> to which I might say, do you think you, maybe this is not what Hume had in mind, but if you have the idea of red and the idea of blue, you think you could conjure up the idea of purple without ever experiencing it? No. No. No, I absolutely not. Now, you say absolutely not. Do you feel pretty comfortable in this case, yeah. or do you think this is also... It's all blue. So you know it has to be darker than, uh, than the left side, and you know it has to be lighter than the right side. So he's kind of he's kind of narrowing it down for you. You had your hand for a while, Phil. I didn't mean to skip over you. No, sorry. Um, I was just going to say, uh, could it be like, a, like in defense of empiricism? You could say it's like a combination of uh, sensation and reflection, which is what... Uh, Locke has been saying, like, you're going to sense both of those uh, shades of blue in between, and then you can use maybe reflection to somehow combine them, which I think would still fall under empiricism. You're getting it through experience. So this would be kind of, I think, what Brianna is also suggesting, the same kind of strategy, that you've got enough in experience, and with reflection we can generate that new idea. Um, yeah? I was just uh, in my head. Uh, aren't there only, like, three real colors, like red, blue, and green, and all the yellow. other colors are just shades of uh, yellow? Yeah. Green green is a combination of blue and yellow. Yeah, you're right. right. And hmm. all the other ones are just like shades in between them? Well, they're... I don't know if that's... I'm not... An, somebody who is an art major may actually be able to correct us on this, but I, uh, I wouldn't call them shades, um, but they're different combinations of them. Oh, is there any art majors in here who can correct me and tell me how we should be thinking about these colors? I know we got the three primary colors, and then you can derive all colors from those three. It's the primary color lights up. That's green. Yellow is pigment. Personally, I think what you guys mean is the secondary colors of the green, the purple, and orange kind of deal. That's what you're looking for. So could we derive secondary... Uh, could we come up with the, the visualization of secondary colors just by knowing the primary colors? I Most people are skeptical. Carlos was downright, you know, skeptical. <laughs> but some people may not be. What were you, you going to say, Amanda? I forgot what I was going to say. The now, if we let me ask, do you still think we could come up with this new shade if we didn't know all of these? If all we knew were these three shades, do you think we could come up with the next one in the sequence? Or do you need to have the one on the other side in order to get to form that new color, that new shade? Once, yeah. Yeah, I think because like you kind of have like both boundaries to form the new shade, where like if you didn't have it, you wouldn't have that like it needs to be darker than that color. If you bite on this and you say otherwise, um, I don't see. Then we could. It seems like we could generate a whole series of new ideas out of this. Like we could blend one color gradually into another. We could learn just through progressive thoughts how to get to the next one. That seems outlandish. 
Um, yeah. I have a question. What is Hume saying exactly? Like, mm -hmm. is he saying that we can't we can't come up with that color on our own? He says you can't. This is sort of the shocking thing. You think as an empiricist who just said <laughs> all of our ideas can be traced to these other parts that are derived from experience, that he would then say, now if you've never experienced something, you can't come up with that idea. But he says, yes, you can. And the same thing goes, another interesting analogy here is with music. He does this with, he briefly mentions music here. Do you think that you could come up with the missing musical note? Like if you've never heard any sound before, the first sound you hear is like, do, re, fa, so. Like, uh, so is a little off. But do um, you think you could come up with the me, in which was me, in between re and fa there without ever having heard those sounds before? Could you come up with the tone that belongs in there? What if you tone <laughs> Well, you don't have to reproduce it. What if you could just think it, right? and just produce the sound, so to speak, in your own mind. Do you think that's possible? The same thing goes with the color, right? I'm not asking you to produce the color. I'm just asking you to think about, can you imagine that color without ever experiencing it? I feel like it's different with, like, I feel like the color, you can imagine it in place. I don't, I don't know. I feel like if you never experienced music, you couldn't. I don't know why. <laughs> contradicting myself. <laughs> well, well, the reason I bring it is it is interesting because we do sometimes get different intuitions about the two cases. So I think it is helpful to think about the two cases here. <coughs> this frustrates so many people because, for one, um, there's some people that have the view that they think you can do this with experience. You don't need to say what Hume said. They're sort of annoyed because they maybe like empiricism in some cases. And so they say, Hume didn't have to make this concession. But here's the other annoying thing. Let's go back to where I just finished reading um, on 540. So this is what Hume says in response to this problem. And this may serve as a proof that the simple ideas are not always, in every instance, derived from the correspondent impressions. Though, here's what really annoys people, this instance is so singular that it is scarcely worth our observing and does not mean that for it alone we should alter our general maxim. So what did he just say there about this? He just dismissed it. <laughs> Pretty much said, here's a problem with my view, something that, that my view says shouldn't happen, but it happens, but it's such a small thing, let's just forget about it for now. <laughs> doesn't, doesn't that seem so dismissive? <coughs> But this kind of, so what is the point, what do you think the point is for this? I think it's him trying to say we shouldn't get so hung up on these little kinds of things. If you have a philosophical theory that does a lot of explaining, and then somebody comes up with some very trivial example that is supposed to undo your whole philosophy, well, that really shouldn't stop us from thinking there's a lot of good in your work. Um, you can find a ton of philosophy that is written about the missing shade of blue if you are ever interested in, in continuing looking into this. Um, let's move on. So, another interesting thing about Hume's empiricism is that he wants to say that there's some value in the way that he's thinking about ideas being copies of impressions. So since all of our ideas are copies of impressions, we can resolve philosophical problems by asking, and let's take a look at this. I've got the answer here from what impression is that supposed idea derived. Let's look at this on 540, 541. Um, so, Let's start about the middle of what, where that is on 540. He says, the limits between them are more exactly determined, nor is it easy to fall into any error or mistake with regard to them. When we entertain, therefore, any suspicion 
This is really the key part. That a philosophical term is employed without any meaning or idea, as is but too frequent, we need but inquire from what impression is that supposed idea derived. <coughs> and if it is impossible to assign any, this will indeed serve to confirm our suspicion. By bringing ideas into so clear a light, we may reasonably hope to remove all dispute which may arise concerning their nature and reality. So people bring up stuff, all the, like philosophers throw around terms like substance or property, cause, freedom, um, virtue, goodness. Hume is going to ask, when people start bringing up strange philosophical terms or things that are used in different ways, he wants to say, let's see if we can trace back where do we get that idea from. Can we find the impressions that give us those ideas? And if we can, that will help us understand what the idea means. If we can't find it, then he's basically saying they're making, you know, they're not making it up, but they don't know what they're talking about. And we should just ignore it. <coughs> So his method is supposed to help us in thinking more clearly and more philosophically. Um, and one of the things, if we read all of this, the very last chapter, very last section of this, very last line of the whole work, he basically says that if some book makes metaphysical claims that we can't find where they come from, <coughs> we should throw the book into the flames, that it's a waste of our time. So, in a way, he's like an anti-philosopher. He's one of these philosophers who says metaphysics is a waste of time because people talk about stuff that really we, can't, we don't know where it comes from. They're, right, they're spinning ideas out of nothing. Um, in the next section, we're going to look at three different relations that he says there are between our ideas. And maybe the key thing to think about this is not just that he likes these three relations, but he's saying these are it. Ideas in the mind can only be related to one another in these three ways. One is by resemblance. And he says, a picture naturally, naturally leads our thoughts to the original. So, um, an idea can resemble another idea. Um, and resemblance is not a, a perfect match. It's just a, you know there are certain ways in which actually um, things can be very, like loose ma matches and resemblance. You know my my one year old daughter resembles my three year old daughter, but they're not identical. Um, the second relation is contiguity, which is so is how he describes it. The mention of one apartment building naturally introduces an inquiry concerning the others. One way to think about this is, is the way in which things are associated with one another, maybe spatially, maybe temporally. If I, if I show you the, front, the surface, the front side of the bottle, it, you could think about the back side of the bottle. Not because the front side resembles the back, or the front side is the cause of the back, but because there's a contiguity of the bottle, the front side and the back side. Even though you're not looking at the back side, by seeing the front side, it could cause you, it could lead you to see, to think about the back side. And then the third, and probably the most important one for our upcoming discussion, is cause and effect. He says, if we think of a wound, we can scarcely forbear reflecting on the pain which follows it. Now, this is something that we might doubt. This morning, I don't know if you can really see, I was scraping ice off my car because Mother Nature decided to give us a snowstorm last night. Um, and I actually ended up, this morning as I was scraping, I wasn't, my hands were numb and I ended up cutting my knuckles. Um, and I didn't discover that till I got to work. Um, I can, it seems like I can think about these wounds without feeling any pain. Um, when I was six years old, I got hit by a car. I know that explains it all. And I can think about that event without feeling the pain. Um, maybe this is just a 
maybe this is just a bad example, although there are other things that we can, that where this cause and effect really is tied together a little more closely. Um, if I have you think about, I may have done this in this class already, but uh, I ask you to think about a really, really, you know, bright yellow, sour lemon. I tell you to think about taking a big, like a big bite out of that. If you think about it real vividly, you can't have that thought without puckering up a little bit and getting, you know, just a little bit of like, you know, like you're about to bite into that lemon, a little of that sour uh, taste. Um, maybe that's just all he's saying is that there are certain ideas which cause us to have other ideas. Um, and that's it. So one thing to think about with this is to think that when he says that these three, there are these three relations between ideas, this, these are the only possible ways that he can see that one idea could be related to another. Nothing else. Any questions about these three idea, three relations between ideas? Yeah. Um, what would be like? If you ate something sour and you thought of a lemon, but it's not a lemon, what would that be? So, like if somebody gave you a lime and you thought it was a lemon? Well, like if you bit it and you're like, oh, this is sour, it tastes like a lemon. Like somebody gives you like lemon head candy? Yeah, like if it, if it leads you to think of a lemon, but it's not. That would probably, I think, would be resemblance. That it would remind you of a lemon, but you wouldn't mistake it for a lemon. Other thoughts on on this? So let's take a brief break, and then we will pick up here at 6.30.